safety. The safety and physical well-being of officers and other individuals in and around the crime scene are the initial responding officer's first priority. The initial responding officers should scan the area for sights, sounds, and smells that may present danger to personnel. For example, hazardous mater materials such as gasoline, natural gas. If the scene involves a clandestine drug laboratory, biological weapons, or radiological or chemical threats, the appropriate agency should be contacted prior to entering the scene. The officers should approach the scene in a manner designed to reduce risk of harm to officers while maximizing the safety of victims, witnesses, and others in the area. The officers should survey the scene for dangerous persons and should control the situation, notify supervisory personnel, and call for backup when needed. Emergency care. After controlling any dangerous situations or persons, the initial responding officer's next responsibility is to ensure that medical attention is provided to injured persons while minimizing contamination to the scene. Initial responding officers should take the following actions. Assess the victim or victims for signs of life and medical needs and provide immediate medical attention. Call for medical personnel. Guide medical personnel to the victim to minimize contamination, alteration of the crime scene. Point out potential physical evidence to medical personnel. Instruct them to minimize contact with such evidence. For example, ensure that medical personnel preserve all clothing and personal effects without cutting through bullet holes, knife cuts. And document movement of persons or items by medical personnel. Instruct medical personnel not to clean up the scene and to avoid removal or alteration of items originating from the scene. If medical personnel arrived first, obtain the names, unit, and telephone number of attending personnel and the name and location of the medical facility where the victim is to be taken. If there is a chance that the victim may die, attempt to obtain a dying declaration. Document any statement, comments made by victims, suspects, or witnesses at the scene. Approaching the scene. The actions taken by the first officers at the scene may have a profound impact on the quality of the crime scene investigation. The first officers should promptly but cautiously approach and enter the scene, remaining observant of any persons, vehicles, events, potential evidence, and environmental conditions. After taking any emergency actions necessary, such as securing medical attention for any injured parties or the arrest or detention of any suspects, the first officer should secure the scene as soon as feasible. The limits of the scene should be determined and a perimeter established with crime scene control tape. Once the perimeter is secured, it must remain secure until completion of the crime scene search and documentation. A permanent record of all individuals present at the scene and those who enter the scene should be started and maintained until completion of the crime scene search. Many departments have a crime scene log form for this purpose. The crime scene log is important to establish the integrity of the scene and to provide follow-up investigators with the names of those individuals who may be responsible for certain items at the scene, such as latent fingerprints or footwear impressions. The log should be signed or initialed by each person who enters the scene. It is important that any suspects be kept out of the scene in order to avoid contamination of the scene by any transfer evidence from the suspects, such as latent fingerprints, footwear impressions, hair and fibers, and so forth, which may be used to link the suspects to the scene. If any suspect is allowed into the scene, any evidence linking the suspect to the scene then has an innocence placement explanation by the suspect. Once the scene is secured, the first officer should tour the crime scene, making notes as to the conditions of the scene. Particular attention should be made of any suspected points of entry or exit by the suspects, conditions of doorways and windows, and the presence of any evidence that needs to be brought to the attention of the investigators. An attempt should be made to determine the circumstances of the crime, keeping in mind that this attempt is a working theory or a hypothesis only, which can be revised as new facts come to light. The officer needs to establish a pathway for those individuals entering and leaving the scene, such as emergency medical personnel, other officers, detectives, and the crime scene investigators. The pathway will help minimize the possibility of evidence destruction and will also establish an orderly crime scene search. The pathway should be documented in the officer's notes and sketches in order to provide a permanent record for follow-up investigators. 
The officer should continue to keep notes as to the progress of the investigation until relieved by other personnel in order to minimize any loss of details. The first responder should be prepared to answer the following questions when the investigators arrive. One, what happened? Two, what physical area does the crime scene cover? Three, who was involved? Four, what time did the incident take place? Five, who has entered the scene? Six, what items in the scene have been disturbed? Seven, if anything has been removed, where is it now and who has custody? Eight, if the victim has been removed, where is the victim? Anticipating these questions will help the investigators in their task of investigating the incident. The first responder should assume that all actions taken at the scene prior to the arrival of the investigative team will need to be explained in court. For this reason, the documentation of the officer's actions is very important to the outcome of the investigation. Most investigations begin at the crime scene, and the initial actions taken may have a profound effect on the case. There is no substitute for precise documentation with adequate notes of the crime scene actions, diagrams, and crime scene data forms completed accurately and thoroughly. Actions to be taken by the first responders. Determine the need for life-saving procedures and emergency personnel. The first priority at any crime scene is the treatment of any injured party and the summoning of emergency medical personnel. It is important to keep in mind the potential loss of evidence through the actions of medical personnel at the scene. Whenever feasible, the first responders should establish an indirect pathway for the medical personnel to approach the victim needing emergency treatment and transport to a medical facility. The few moments taken to use this indirect route to reach the victim and remove him or her to the ambulance may save valuable evidence without any danger to the treatment of the victim. The pathway established for the medical personnel should also be used by the first responders and the follow-up investigators for the initial surveys of the scene. This procedure will avoid any further damage to the evidence present at the scene. It is particularly helpful to avoid common pathways for travel inside a residence or to avoid the direct route from the roadway to the side of the victim in an outdoor setting, as these pathways are the usual routes taken by the perpetrator of the crime. Remove and detain witnesses and suspects from the scene. Witnesses and potential suspects should be removed from the scene as soon as practical. In no case should a potential suspect be admitted to the crime scene, as this action allows for cross-contamination between the scene and the suspect with respect to impression and trace evidence, thus providing an innocent explanation for the presence of these types of evidence at the scene. Appropriate data should be obtained from each witness for follow-up contacts by investigators assigned to the case. Secure the scene and establish the crime scene perimeter. Once the emergency actions have been taken and the witnesses and suspects have been identified and removed, the scene should be secured in order to preserve the evidence present. It is necessary to determine the limits of the crime scene and to establish the perimeter with crime scene tape. For indoor crime scenes, the residence or building will ordinarily define the scene limits, but in some cases, the property on which the structure is located is also part of the crime scene. In outdoor crime scenes, the first responders need to exercise good judgment as to the extent of the scene, keeping in mind it is better to err on the side of caution and to provide a safety margin in establishing the secure perimeter of the scene. The scene should be secured with crime scene tape or other markers. It is important to ensure that only those personnel with legitimate business at the crime scene be allowed inside the perimeter established. Compile scene data. As soon as the scene is secured, the first responder should begin compiling the necessary data with regard to response to the scene and initiate the crime scene log that lists the entry of all individuals into the crime scene, including those present upon arrival. Most departments will have forms for these tasks. See the list of pertinent data under the heading for the crime scene investigators. Make an initial survey of the crime scene. The initial survey of the scene should be done in a systematic manner taking notes of observations as to possible evidence present, any evidence that has been removed, the person responsible for this ev evidence, and observations regarding the pertinent data listed in a later section. It is imperative that nothing be disturbed at the scene until the scene has been photographed and sketched in the condition found. Do not attempt to replace evidence that has been moved, disturbed, or collected prior to the crime scene documentation but rather take notes as to how and why the evidence has been disturbed. The initial survey of the scene should be issue-oriented 
and include an assessment of the potential evidence present to the scene based on the working theory for the W's of any investigation. What happened? Who did it? Why? Where did the events take place? What was the sequence of events? Where were the points of entry and exit? These questions and the working theory should help to provide a basis for determining the presence of potential evidence. It is important to keep an open mind with regard to the working theory, making adjustments as new facts come to light. Take steps to preserve any fragile evidence at the scene. Fragile evidence includes that evidence that may be destroyed by inclement weather. Items such as footwear impressions that may be exposed to rain should be covered with a cardboard box or other protective covering to avoid loss of the evidence. Crime scene investigator. Choice of crime scene investigator. The crime scene investigator may be the patrol officer assigned to the detail, a crime scene investigator from the crime scene unit, or the detective assigned to the case. The choice as to the personnel assigned to process the crime scene is usually based on the type of crime committed, department guidelines for the level of response for these crimes, the size of the agency, and the size of the crime scene to be processed. In major crimes, the crime scenes will usually be processed by a team of investigators. Regardless of the number or classification of the crime scene personnel, it is essential that the crime scenes be processed in an orderly, systematic manner. It is important to have clearly established departmental orders as to who is in charge of the crime scene, what the responsibilities are of the various personnel involved, what procedures are to be implemented, and of most importance, who is permitted to access the scene. Record pertinent data immediately. Most departments will have departmental forms for recording scene data that must be filled out at the crime scene, detailing the information listed in the following sections. The advantages of having forms for the information needed include not having to write in all the necessary headings, having a standardized format for data retrieval, having a convenient memory assist for needed details, and having a format for the orderly accumulation of crime scene information. Record time called to scene and individual making the call. The time of the call to the scene should be accurate since alibis are based on time and place. Although most departments will have a log of callouts, it is a good practice to document the time in your notes. The individual making the call should also be included for thoroughness in the notes. Record time arrived at scene. It is important to have an accurate time for arrival at the scene for first responders and the crime scene investigative team members as the first step in the accurate documentation of the scene. Record actions taken to secure the crime scene. If this has not been done, secure the scene immediately. The first responders to the scene should have secured the scene prior to your arrival. If this procedure has not been done, then the scene should be secured immediately and the perimeter delineated with crime scene tape. If the entire crime scene is inside a dwelling, the scene can be secured by keeping the door closed and having an officer maintain security at the door. If the extent of the crime scene at the dwelling is not known, the entire plot for the dwelling should be secured with crime scene tape. Record persons at scene were present on arrival, left scene prior to arrival, arrived after your arrival, persons and times. This record should be in addition to the log started by the first responders so that a complete record of all individuals entering the crime scene is established. The first responders will often need to respond to another detail before the crime scene processing is completed and the crime scene investigator's entry log will supplement the log started by the first responders, thus providing a complete record from start to finish at the crime scene. Record all case file data for all departments involved. Record the departments involved, the case file numbers, and the contact person from each department involved in this case. It is important to have the telephone numbers and usual working hours for each individual for follow-up investigations. Record names of all victims and suspects known at the time. Enter the names of the victims and suspects in the department crime scene forms or your notes if this information is known at the time. If not, make a notation that the names are not known at the time of response to the scene. Contact the first officer at the scene. Obtain overview of circumstances known and observations made by the responding officer. The first responders to the scene will have information about the conditions at the scene prior to any alterations and information about the incident known at that time. 
Determine areas that can be crossed without destroying potential evidence. If a pathway for entering and surveying the scene has not been established, it should be established at this point. Obtain information from the first officer as to what areas have been entered and by whom, so that elimination samples can be obtained from the, these individuals should the need arise. Tour the scene with the first responder. Tour the scene with the first responder, making sure to follow any established pathway. Record all pertinent observations during the tour with the first responder, comparing notes with the officer as to the observations made with regard to the types of physical evidence that may be present. Any alterations to the condition of the scene prior to the arrival of the investigating team should be noted. Note especially any evidence that has been collected by the first officers at the scene. Make notations as to which items were collected and by whom, whether or not the chain of custody was initiated, and who will be responsible for booking the evidence into the evidence room. Establish a command center for the operation. The command center may be as simple as an area set aside at the scene for the placement of the equipment necessary to process the scene, in the case of a small scene, or it may be a complex command post in the case of a large and complex scene. Establish a plan for processing the scene. Confer with all individuals assisting in the search. Advise everyone that all evidence is to be collected only by the team members responsible for evidence collection. Those individuals assisting in the search should not move or disturb any evidence item before it has been documented with notes, sketches, and photographs, and processed for latent fingerprints if applicable. Establish the plan for processing the scene, making sure that each team member is certain of his or her role in the search and the way that the search is to proceed. This step is crucial for those crimes that have a number of areas to be covered by separate teams or individuals. The crime scene processing plan should also include consideration of the safety of the search team. For those scenes where hazardous materials are encountered, individuals with the proper training, experience, and equipment should be in charge of processing that scene. Take note of the safety precautions at the end of the chapters on latent fingerprints and homicide scenes. Clandestine laboratory crime scenes present exceptional hazards and should be processed only by specialized personnel with hazardous material training and equipment. Data to be compiled before collection process. The following data may be entered on the appropriate form or if no departmental forms exist, the data should be entered in the notes of the crime scene investigator. Presence of unusual odors. The presence of unusual odors may be short-lived. The odor of accelerants should be noted in the case of suspected arson. Presence and condition of blood stains. The condition of any blood stains should be noted, especially if the blood stains constitute spatter patterns. Note also large pools of blood and the signs of blood clotting. Signs of struggle. Note any furniture out of place or knocked over. Do not move the displaced items until the scene has been thoroughly documented. Note any smearing of blood stains that may indicate a struggle after wounds have been inflicted. Points of entry and exit. The points of entry and or exit may have evidence that will help identify the perpetrator, including latent fingerprints, trace evidence such as hairs and fibers, footwear impressions, and tool marks in the case of forced entry. Condition of windows and doors, locked, unlocked, open, closed. Occasionally, it is necessary to open or close doors and windows during the scene investigation. It is important to note the condition of the doors and windows so that any changes affected at the scene are documented. Condition of trash containers, especially layer sequence. The layer sequence of trash containers may help in reconstructing time sequences of events at the scene. The layer sequence and any dated materials should be noted. Condition and contents of ashtrays. Note the presence and brands of cigarettes in ashtrays. Remember that DNA typing may need to be attempted on the cigarette butts in the ashtrays, so that handling should be done with gloved hands or forceps. Evidence of drinking and or drug use. Note the presence of liquor bottles and glassware and the approximate contents of each. The bottles and glassware offer excellent surfaces for latent prints and should be handled accordingly. Drug outfits may also be processed for latent impressions, with precautions taken for infectious agents. Evidence disturbed or collected prior to arrival and persons who are responsible for this evidence. Any evidence disturbed or collected prior to the arrival of the crime scene investigator should be noted. 
determine who collected the evidence and that the chain of possession has been documented. Condition of light switches. In your notes, document the condition of the light switches. It may be necessary to turn the switches on or off during photography, especially for photographs during forensic light examinations or photographs of luminol treated bloodstains. Crime scene search. Be systematic. A crime scene search is defined as a systematic, methodical search for any physical evidence at a crime scene. A systematic approach to the documentation of the scene and the collection of the physical evidence present is essential in order to ensure that all necessary steps have been taken, which will realize the potential of the physical evidence and that the evidence is admissible in a court of law. A systematic approach to crime scene processing also has the advantage of providing the most efficient and effective use of the investigative team's time and resources, while at the same time providing the optimum benefit of the physical evidence present at the scene. The sequence of actions that follows is recommended at the scene. Adequate notes of actions taken at the scene. Adequate notes should be taken during the entire crime scene search to reflect all actions taken at the scene and the notes should include notations regarding A, listing of photographs taken, B, listing of evidence collected, C, any sketches prepared, and D, observations made during the processing of the scene. Photography of the scene before the scene is disturbed. General overview photographs to illustrate the condition of the scene. Photographs should be taken to document the condition of the scene as found before processing and collection of evidence begins. Photographs from the point of view of all witnesses. Photographs from the point of view of eyewitnesses should be taken in order to document whether or not the witness or witnesses were in a position to see the area and objects recorded in the witness statements. Record both the vertical and the horizontal position of the camera in the notes and the sketches. These photographs will assist the investigators in determining the accuracy of witness statements. Mid-range photographs. Mid-range photographs should be taken to illustrate spatial relationships of all evidence items and their relationship to the overall scene. Photographs of the evidence items. Specific photographs of each evidence item should be taken to illustrate the location and the condition of all items of evidence, including item number markers and or rulers as needed. The position and condition of evidence items may be important in reconstructing the crime scene. Photographs of each evidence item combined with adequate notes and sketches will allow for accurate recreation of the scene for reconstruction efforts. The use of measurement rulers is essential for those items for which spatial characteristics are important in a reconstruction. For example, bloodstain patterns and bullet impacts. Sketches of the scene to document any evidence present. Layout sketches. The layout sketches illustrate the relationship of the various crime scene areas to each other and assist in orienting the reader of reports to the nature of the crime scene and its component parts. The layout sketches are not necessarily measured as the purpose of these sketches is to provide a visual framework for the detailed measured sketches and the photographs taken. Detailed sketches of pertinent areas. Detailed sketches with measurements of pertinent areas should be prepared showing all measurements for the area in the exact location of evidence items. Include large items such as furniture to show spatial relationships. Large scale blow up sketches. Prepare large scale sketches of those areas needing greater detail. Bloodstain patterns. Prepare sketches of each area having bloodstain patterns. Complement the sketches with photographs showing each area sketched. It is helpful to use the grid, corner label, or perimeter scale method for these methods. Bullet entry and exit holes. Measure carefully the location of each bullet hole and describe its appearance. Photograph each hole, both entry and exit sites, with a measurement scale next to the hole. Location and orientation of impression evidence. Sketch the location of footwear impressions and tool mark impressions, showing their orientation and directional characteristics. Areas having a large number of small evidence items. Prepare a large scale sketch of each area having a large number of small evidence items, such as expended casings. It is helpful to use the secondary reference points method for the measurements. Crime scene search. Use of systematic search methods. Strip method for outdoor scenes. Grid or double strip method for outdoor scenes. 
zone method for indoor or outdoor scenes, spiral method for large objects in large outdoor scenes. Recording of evidence. Make sure that each item is photographed and located on the sketches before collection. It is strongly recommended that at least two individuals locate and mark each item so that either can testify as to the documentation and collection of the evidence in a court proceeding in the event that one of the individuals is unavailable for testimony. Separate areas, collectors. Separate areas and or collectors can be coded with letters or Roman numerals to avoid confusion when the inventory list is completed. This procedure will be exceptionally helpful in large scale areas or investigations where there are a number of scenes and individuals involved in the search and collection of physical evidence. The coding system should be developed during the planning of the search before the actual search and collection begins. Example, a large scale search involving three separate areas and three search teams can be coded as areas A, B, and C. Each area should have one individual assigned as the evidence collection officer for each area. Each evidence item would then be coded with the letter prefix corresponding to the particular area. Item A1, A2, A3, B1, B2, C1, C2, etc. For very large scale searches, multiple burial sites in a serial murder case, for example, it may be necessary to subdivide further the evidence collection responsibilities. In this case, coding can be done by following an outline form, designating the larger areas with Roman numerals, and designating the subsections of each larger area with capital letters. Each evidence item collected would then have a Roman numeral designating the major subdivision, a capital letter for the smaller subdivision, and a number designating the item number from that site. 1A1, 1A2, 1B1, 1B2, 2A1, 2A2, etc. The pre-planned evidence numbering system will give the evidence list compilations coherence for the investigators and prosecutors. Systematic search methods. There are several different methods used to search a crime scene systematically. The advantage of using these methods is the thoroughness with which the crime scene is searched. The choice of method depends on the size and number of scenes, the type of crime scene to be searched, and the number of personnel available for the search. The principal methods used include the strip method, the grid method, the zone method, and the spiral method. Additionally, there is the wheel or radius method, whereby the investigator follows a straight line from the center of the scene to the perimeter, returns to its center, then follows another line of radius, continuing until the circle is covered. Since this last method is very time consuming and may lead to missing a portion of the pie during the search, it is therefore not recommended. See chapter 14 for the search of a vehicle where the vehicle is a crime scene. Strip method, and you will notice as I read that I will only say strip method, I will not say strip search even when the text says it. The strip method involves setting up lanes or strips, each strip to be searched by one searcher. The lanes should be as narrow as feasible so that each searcher can scan the lane thoroughly from side to side without missing any item of evidence. This technique is especially good for outdoor scenes, particularly when the area to be searched is large and involves a team of searchers. The search lanes should not be wider than the area that can be easily seen by each individual searcher. A lane width of approximately arm's length on either side of each, ser each search member should be the maximum width for the lanes. The lanes need to be marked to avoid missing any portion of the scene. This task can be accomplished by driving stakes at each end of the lanes and tying heavy twine to the stakes in order to delineate each lane. When the end of each lane is reached, the stakes and their lines are moved parallel fashion to maintain continuity of the lanes across the area to be searched. The strip method is particularly suited for outdoor scenes where the search party is looking for items that are relatively small, such as ejected cartridge cases. This method is equally good for those items that are intermediate in size, such as handguns, footwear impressions, or items discarded by a suspect while fleeing the scene. The strip method can also be used for indoor scenes where the areas to be covered have relatively large floor spaces, such as those found in a sizable warehouse. Indoor areas found in residences or small buildings are usually more easily searched by using the zone method. Grid method. 
The grid method, sometimes called the double strip method, requires a first search as in the strip method. A second search is completed by orienting the lanes at right angles to the first lanes searched. Use the stakes and twine method for establishing the lanes to be searched using the same guidelines for lane width as in the strip method. The advantage of the grid method over the other methods is the thoroughness of the search that it provides. Each area of the grid is effectively searched twice, thus reducing considerably the chance that an evidence item will be missed in the search. For evidence items that are very difficult to find, such as expended cart cartridge cases in tall grass, the search team may have to conduct the search on their hands and knees in order to ensure that no items are missed during the search. Although tedious and time consuming, this technique will ensure that no items have been missed by the search team. Zone method. The zone method consists of dividing the scene into zones to be searched. This method is sometimes referred to as a sector method or a cupboard method. Each zone can then be subdivided into smaller and smaller zones as circumstances require. For example, large indoor scenes or outdoor scenes can be divided into large zones for search by separate teams. Each zone can then be subdivided by its search team in order to increase the efficiency of the overall search. This method is also the one of choice for recording the location and shapes of bloodstain patterns, firearm projectile trajectories, or other types of evidence where the interrelationship of each of the components of the area is a paramount concern. Spiral method. In the spiral search method, the search team starts at the designated center of the scene and follows a spiral path outward from the center until the perimeter of the scene is reached. Not recommended for indoor scenes or smaller outdoor scenes, as the zone method and strip methods are much more efficient for these areas. The spiral method may be used effectively for searching a large outdoor scene where the search team is looking for very large objects that are easy to see. Dumped bodies, for example. The size of the lanes should be kept to a minimum. Finishing the crime scene search, debriefing. At the conclusion of a crime scene search, a crime scene debriefing team should be assembled prior to releasing the scene. The debriefing team should include the investigators in charge of the crime scene, other investigators and evidence collection personnel, for example, photographers, evidence technicians, latent print personnel, specialized personnel, and, in and initial responding officers, if still present. The debriefing allows the members to share information regarding a particular scene findings and provides an opportunity for input regarding follow-up investigation, special requests for assistance, and the establishment of post-scene responsibilities. The debriefing team should address the topics and questions that follow. Have all areas been documented and searched? Have witness statements developed information that indicates that further searches are necessary? Additional areas, other evidence? Have all parties completed their assignments? Is all evidence collected, properly packaged, and accounted for? Has a research of the scene been made? Carefully go over the scene again, looking for any evidence items missed. Note, a scene searched at night almost always should be researched when the sun comes up. Should the scene remain preserved or secured? Often, information gained at a homicide autopsy or medical examination in a sexual assault case will indicate additional actions necessary at the crime scene. The scene should ordinarily be secured until completion of an autopsy or medical examination. Remember, if the scene is left unprotected, it will never be the same again, and any additional search may require an additional search warrant. Initiate any actions identified in the debriefing required to complete the crime scene investigation. Discuss potential forensic testing and the sequence of tests to be performed. Brief the person in charge upon completion of assigned crime scene tasks. Establish post-scene responsibilities for law enforcement personnel and other responders. Perform a final survey of the crime scene. Final survey of the crime scene. After the crime scene debriefing has been held and before the scene is released to the appropriate individual or agency, a final survey of the scene should be conducted. This survey ensures that pertinent evidence has been collected, that evidence, equipment, or materials generated by the investigation are not inadvertently left behind, and that any dangerous materials or conditions have been reported and addressed. The investigators in charge should conduct a walkthrough and ensure that each area identified as part of the crime scene is visually inspected. At the conclusion of the debriefing and final walkthrough, 
The investigator releases the scene in accordance with jurisdictional requirements. Summary. There are a number of methods available for conducting a crime scene search. The particular circumstances of the scene may dictate which of the methods is chosen to conduct the search. The crime scene investigator will, will rapidly gain insight into which type of search method needs to be employed at a crime scene. The nature of the crime scene and other factors such as weather or traffic may influence the method of choice. However, it is essential to ensure that the scene is searched thoroughly with a systematic method to maximize the information gained from the scene search and to minimize the chance that evidence will be overlooked or compromised because of an inadequate search. Regardless of the method chosen by the crime scene investigator, it is crucial that the search is conducted in a systematic manner and that the search covers all areas that may contain potential evidence in the investigation. It is far better to cover too much area than not enough because a single item of evidence may be the crucial piece of the puzzle that may be lost forever if not located and collected during the initial search. At the conclusion of the crime scene processing, the investigators in charge should institute a debriefing team to ensure that all necessary procedures have been carried out by the crime scene team.